All right, I've got with me here Adrian Meyer. Hello, Adrian. Hi. So tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, I'm Adrian Meyer. I'm a multidisciplinary digital artist from Germany with Houdini as kind of my main weapon of choice. I do uh, general VFX and FX work, and I love to experiment with procedural workflows. I also do real-time visuals with Touch Designer, and I recently ventured into the world of 360 VR. And um, about a year ago, I graduated at um, Film Academy Baden-Württemberg in animation and effects. That's in Ludwigsburg in Germany. And uh, yeah, that's it. Cool. And what's your presentation today about? Um, I'm going to talk about how I used Houdini for my um, recent VR film called Strengths of Mind, which was my graduation project um, over a period of three years. And I'm mainly going to focus on tech and pipeline aspects, um, yeah, with a special focus on my fractal workflow. Very cool. Well, let's jump in. Hi, my name is Adrian Meyer, and in this presentation, I'm going to talk about fractals and other procedural madness that I created for my 360 VR experience called Strengths of Mind. So Strengths of Mind is a 12-minute cinematic 360 VR experience. It's um, kind of a psychedelic journey that explores a world beyond our normal human perception and the nature of existence. It is currently running on many international festivals and venues, and it's going to be released in VR stores next year. It is pre-rendered 4K um, in stereoscopic 360. And I, of course, thought about doing it in a game engine in six degrees of freedom and real time. But as I wanted the visuals to be very organic and highly visually complex, I quickly had to come to the conclusion that this wasn't possible in real time, at least when I started the production, but I fear it still wouldn't be. Um, though I am hoping that I might do um, a future project in a game engine. Um, also, I didn't really want any interactivity. I wanted it more to be a passive trip that you can fall into and not be disturbed by any interactive elements. So in this case, this wasn't a big sacrifice. Um, but with that, I really had the ambition to do a very high quality 360 um, and with high quality stereo. And also with a concept um, to not let you feel the, the constraint of uh, 3D degrees of freedom experience um, opposed to a full sixth of experience. It also has full ambisonic spatial audio that makes it much more immersive. Um, the whole thing is almost entirely created procedurally in Houdini and compositing is done in Nuke. So a huge part um, of the film are these kind of dark fractal scapes and they are all rendered with Arnold from Houdini as the entire film is. And I'm gonna talk specifically about the fractal pipeline later on. It also features a psychedelic forest with lots of high-res acids and very dynamic shading for the luminescence. Um, and for that, I created quite an extensive custom uh, asset set dressing and shading pipeline, which I'm also gonna talk about later. And finally, there is, of course, a luminous baby floating beneath a black hole in outer space, um, which internally also has a lot of geometry, a procedural geometry, um, as throughout the film, there's lots of procedurally generated stuff, which I'm going to talk about later. But before going into the nerdy tech behind all that, let's watch the trailer.
And as a quick overview, I'll show you a short VFX breakdown. All right, so let me give you a pipeline overview. As I mainly created the film alone, I had really had to come up with a smart pipeline and automate many, many tasks um, to tackle the quite heavy workload. Um, especially the 360 stereo VR required many tools to be reinvented because there's not a lot of out-of-the-box solutions. And um, yeah, during the talk, I'm only going to focus on some aspects of the pipeline, of course, um, because it would be a bit too much otherwise. So the pipeline constantly evolved um, during the project, basically almost right until the end. And I ended up with uh, 140 custom Houdini digital assets and 125 Houdini shelf tools. Um, and these tools included many production aspects like 360 tools, um, file cache and asset management, set dressing tools, custom, a custom speed tree pipeline, lots of render farm and PDG tools, and also um, very important uh, video encoding pipeline via PDG. So with 360, you end up encoding hundreds and hundreds um, of videos with um, quite uh, special and extensive settings with FFmpeg. So it was really important and a lifesaver to automate that um, with PDG. Not really the focus here, but especially in Nuke and compositing, I needed many custom 360 and stereo tools that weren't really present. And I ended up with 50 custom Nuke gizmos just for the production. Um, I had some help from a fellow TD student with that. In total, I ended up with over 14,000 lines of Python code um, that were mainly Houdini specific or at least related. Um, but a lot of the code was, was authored um, or triggered from Houdini. As the film is produced in 4K stereo at 60 FPS in 360, this led to a pretty crazy render load for a short film in a university environment. So I ended up with over 90 million gigahertz hours of farm rendering and simulation, which uh, equals 580 years uh, of rendering on, an, on a single i7 quad-core PC. And uh, all in all, I generated around 400 terabytes of data during the production. So I was quite lucky that my university environment could, could handle um, such a crazy workload. All right, let's talk a bit about procedural growth and procedural geometry. So as I mentioned, there is just procedural geometry everywhere, which is kind of obvious if you're working with Houdini, like these uh, vein systems in, in the embryo that were fluorescent, um, or also things like this organic tunnel where basically completely created procedural with a vein system as a base and then some, um, some other procedural layers on top. But 
I also had much more complex systems that had um, longer simulation times. And at that time, PDG and TOPS were brand new. Um, it's around three years ago. So I started using um, PDG for creating uh, these simulation variations. But during that, I faced some challenges and limitations that motivated me to build a tool set that facilitates creating and managing large wedge variation counts for simulations. And I called this tool PDG Mutagen. <clears throat> Firstly, the tool provides a nice UI for reviewing um, wedge results returned from the PDG farm directly in the Houdini UI. And it is possible to select um, the results and uh, preview them in RV or the file browser. You can also directly select the uh, 3D geometry um, in the viewport over the video thumbnails and explore the, the actual 3D result, which is very handy. And it provides a one-click solution to convert take-based wedging to top-based wedging. So I'm still a big fan of the old take-based wedging system in Houdini. And um, at least at that time, it wasn't possible uh, to, to convert take-based wedging um, or to, to have take-based wedging in PDG. So um, I built a tool to, to quickly convert that. Um, all that was wrapped up with nice shelf tools that uh, quickly and automatically set up the top networks for you. So you were very quickly set to go with um, yeah, quite complex wedging setups. Finally, it allows you to select your desired results and use them as a base for new generations and mutations. So you could choose the results you like the most and from these parameter sets um, as a base, new parameter sets um, that, that kind of spread it out the parameter space um, from there could be set up very easily and yeah, thus um, created mutations. So the name PDG Mutagen. All right, let's talk about the fractal pipeline, which was quite um, an essential part of the of the production. So in the R&D phase, I, of course, did some research on different approaches that existed so far um, on how to tackle fractals in, in VFX. Uh, and I wanted to check if I could make my life easy and maybe go a similar way. So I first stumbled across Disney's approach. Um, they had these nice volumetric Mandelbrot variations for the film Big Hero 6. And um, I think it looks super, super cool. Um, but the approach wasn't so suited for me because it was um, largely static fractals and it still evol involved a lot of manual um, set dressing. So artists, layout artists could uh, set dress with like proxy uh, fractals that were then later on up by the FX department. Also, I didn't want that cloudy milky look all the time, even though it's very cool. Um, also, Animal Logic, uh, they had a point cloud rendering approach um, and they built the fractals from Houdini for uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. So, um, these kind of columns here, internally, they have fractal point cloud geometry and uh, but they are contained within kind of bounding boxes and are sitting in traditional geometry. So, and they were also completely static and I needed um, full th uh, fractal environments and not, not just fractal parts. So it wasn't completely suited for me. Um, and Weta Digital here on the, on the lower right left, um, they had a quite unexpected result. Um, they actually, used a software called Mandelbulb 3D. So this is a dedicated fractal software that can produce nice fractal images. It's um, only made for, for creating fractals and it creates kind of nice images. But the problem is it's completely contained in itself. It's, it's limited. You cannot export any uh, point clouds, any geometry, any camera animation whatsoever. Um, also Animal Logic used that for, for pre vising and, and look devving. But as the fractals were kind of trapped in the software, they created um, the point clouds in Houdini. But Weta um, actually came up with the idea to render turntables from Mandelbulb 3D and then uh, fed the, feed these turntables into a classical photogrammetry pipeline and then um, get fractal meshes in the end. So here you see these fractal meshes that could then be used to kind of manually set dress um, the scenes which is also really cool, but again, it's static. And to me, it seemed also a bit uh, cumbersome and um, 
inexact. So I also, I really had different needs. I needed a full 360 fractal environment. Um, so the other approaches, they, they had classical VFX or CG sets and they wanted to include some fractal elements. For me, it was the other way around. I wanted to have fractal environments and include some classical 3D geometry. Also, I wanted to have um, one kind of typical uh, deep endless zoom into the fractals. And I wanted to have the possibility to, to have the fractals morphing and fully in motion in themselves and not being static. So finally, um, it was really important to me to have a very flexible and fast design exploration possibility because I'm, I wasn't an, an army of artists and I needed to be very fast and intuitive. So the first approach was to um, build a, a tool called Visual Effects Fractal Toolkit. So I teamed up with a fellow student um, who, who worked on that. And it's a Node-based, OpenCL, Python-based um, fractal point cloud generation system in Houdini. So here you can see it in action. Um, you have these uh, fractal nodes and you could combine different fractal nodes to create kind of hybrid fractals. You had uh, fractal parameters exposed in the UI and play around with them. And yeah, it was quite a, a promising approach. Unfortunately, um, at some point, the tool, we realized the tool doesn't work out for the production due to multiple issues, but mainly um, because Houdini has a 32-bit precision limitation. And um, that mean, meant that the resolution degraded more and more when you um, dive deeper and deeper into the fractal. And also you, you um, were basically unable to navigate at all at some point. So this was really a pity because the tool was very promising. But then also um, my fellow TD student graduated. So I had to come up with a different solution on my own. And I used another fractal software called, Ma called Mandelbulber for prototyping on my fractals before. And um, it's kind of a similar software to Mandelbulb 3D, um, just a bit more modern and more open source. And I really liked the results geometry wise, and it was very fast and intuitive to use the tool. Um, again, because it's only built for this purpose. It's built for creating fractals. But from a VFX standpoint, it is very limited. You, you, have, you don't really have proper lighting, PBR shading. You cannot really combine it with 3D objects. So I really wanted to bring the fractals I already had to the VFX world to combine them with proper volumetric shading, um, particles, geometry destruction. So to combine the fractals with shattered fractal elements. So I decided for building a pipeline bridge from Mandelbulba to Houdini and do all the fractal exploration, layout, camera animation in Mandelbulba, and then hand that over to Houdini for further 3D integration and lighting and shading rendering. So here you see Mandelbulba in action. So I'm exploring some sets of mine here. This is real time. So you see it's um, quite fast. It's GPU based. Um, so I teamed up with the Mandelbulba developers on GitHub and uh, we together we implemented some features that were needed to, for this Houdini bridge. Because again, the software is meant for doing fractals. It produces kind of nice images, but you cannot export anything. Um, no geometry, no point clouds, no camera animation. So first of all, we did some 360 stereo enhancements, which were important for me. Uh, we uh, implemented the position and world normal pass, which was very important and the possibility to include camera metadata into the EXR images that were exported. And finally, a custom render farm integration, because still there was quite a bit of rendering from Mandelbulber. So finally, I could send fractal layout scenes as utility passes to the farm, and then in Houdini with a shelf tool with a easy to use one-click solution, basically I could import camera animation, the fractal point cloud, and that was internally processed in quite a complex fractal HDA that um, internally processed the utility passes to a full point cloud that worked for 360 stereo rendering. It had lots of options like viewport LODs. Um, you could choose if it was a per frame um, camera based point cloud or you could accumulate all the different frames and camera angles to like a more watertight static mesh or a point cloud. You also had the option to um, import different utility layers like 
fractal pattern masks, ambient occlusion passes that were exported from Mandelbulber. I could also import uh, layout lights from Mandelbulber with one click and use them as a lighting base. So sometimes I, I just did a, a pre-lighting in Mandelbulber to get a general idea of lighting directions and then just um, transport that to Arnold with one click basically. For destruction and additional manual placement of fractal elements, these sparse camera dependent point clouds um, weren't enough. So I needed full fractal object scans. And um, yeah, Weta used the photogrammetry um, workflow for that. But again, for me, it seemed a bit inexact and cumbersome. But with the workflow I already had developed, it was very easy to take turntable renders um, or just renders from different angles of um, parts of interest in the fractals I like, and then uh, use these utility passes uh, with the exact camera data baked into the XRs and could convert that into dense watertight point clouds or meshes in Houdini. And they were 100% mathematically correct, basically. Um, and then I could use them to, um, to shatter them and place them manually, instance them, etc. cetera. So that was, uh, that was quite fun, actually. For the morphing fractals that had motion in themselves, um, I needed a velocity attribute of the fractal surface to drive particle simulations. As you know, with changing topology, um, generating velocity attributes is quite difficult and it gets more difficult uh, if this is like a fractal 360 point cloud. Um, but with optical flow and some vex math, I um, luckily managed to really get the velocity attributes and drive some secondary simulations of that. Not directly related with the fractal pipeline itself, but I had the idea to let Google, the Google Deep Dream algorithm, dream on the fractal renders. And um, this was for one very um, trippy stroboscopic sequence in the film. But then I had to think about how to approach this in 360 and especially in stereo. So first I thought, okay, I, I would want to um, let the algorithm um, match the left and right eye. So features are sitting in the same place in the same depth, but this didn't really work out. It kind of killed um, the, the depth effect a little bit. So then I thought, okay, let's just try to let the algorithm dream on the left and right eye separately, which is completely wrong. Um, but it actually uh, gave really cool and trippy results because you had that proper stereo depth um, from the fractals and then you had these oddly placed um, psychedelic elements throughout the depth space. So yeah, that was, that was really cool. All right, let's talk about the speed tree pipeline. So there were lots of trees and I worked on it kind of alone. So for this, again, I needed a, a pipeline to have this very automated. Um, so my speed tree pipeline um, could set up uh, a custom speed tree HDA that automatically sets up groups, materials, textures. Um, it, um, it even... that automatically sets up groups, materials, textures, uh, even displacement scales based on the tree size. So it first normalizes and centers the displacement values from the displacement texture. So it reads the um, values from a JSON um, texture library. It sets preview thumbnails in the network editor and a um, lot of nice stuff like this. It also sets up a custom production Uber shader that features material blending. So you could have different materials on the top and bottom of the tree. Um, options for procedural moss, mold, per instance, color variations, luminescence, iridescence, and much more fun stuff like this. You had culling and LOD options and many controls over the geometry attribute creation like curvature, um, ambient occlusion, thickness, etc. As Speedtree doesn't export a looped animation, um, you, uh, the, the animation was automatically looped in Houdini and you had controls over that, um, a integrated geometry cache farm submission. So with the whole pipeline, basically within one click, I could set up a fully shaded and animated tree. Um, and having also a turntable with it, um, I could do another click and just send multiple turntables of that to the farm. So that was very, very handy and helped me a lot in the end. 
Um, when I started the production, I used Houdini 16.5 and later moved to Houdini 17. So there wasn't any Solaris yet, unfortunately, and also not really any sophisticated scatter and instance pipeline or yeah, scatter and instance tools, which was a bit of a pity to be because um, to be honest, if I would do the project now, I would probably approach this in a different way and use Solaris. But back then I really had to come up um, with their own solution. So um, for efficient set dressing and scattering um, instancing of animated objects and also to control all of these instances with attributes to make them glow or to make them move more in the wind and stuff like this, I built quite an extensive modular system. So I had many set dressing HDAs for procedural scattering, painting, drawing, manual placement, um, a population wizard where I could just, uh, just choose some, some assets and um, randomize them, um, had control over how many of which asset I want, to, I want to scatter, controls over density, noise, scale orientation, and also a very fast collision detection. Um, also, I could easily extract and unpack instances for things like colli um, collisions with a river simulation, uh, which was ID-based and non-destructive. And also, I had a nice sub-instance um, system, so I could easily create packs of instances um, and scatter or paint small instances um, on other instances. So, for instance, uh, <laughs> lots of instances. Uh, for, uh, so, mushrooms on trees or moss on trees. And this um, enabled me to have a very efficient handling of almost endless variations in the forest. There was also a plant motion HDA um, and uh, lots of global animation um, settings. So I could offset the animation, but also quantize them to re reduce the amount of unique instances in the scene, which optimized rendering quite a bit. And finally, I built a custom node preset manager um, that where I could easily save and load presets for nodes. They, uh, it has a, had an override and append mode, and it was JSON based. Um, now the new uh, Houdini preset manager um, also is JSON based, but it still doesn't have um, append options. So you could already have a preset, but then append another preset um, and also some other advanced features. So this is why I built my own preset manager. All right, so that were um, all the pipeline parts I wanted to talk about. Um, all in all, it was quite a journey creating the film, technically and creatively. Um, and Houdini was really the only option I could ever imagine to create something like this due to its nature of proceduralism, which also conceptually fitted the film very well. So it was a lot of fun building it with Houdini. So with that, um, thank you for your attention and goodbye.